It'd be only fair, said Brother Watchtower slowly. But Brother Plasterer was right, really. I can't see a scion manifesting his destiny just because Brother Doorkeeper thinks the woman in the vegetable shop keeps giving him funny looks. No offense. And bloody short wait, said Brother Doorkeeper. And she... Yes, 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 said the Supreme Grand Master. Truly the right-thinking folk of Ankh Morpork are beneath the heel of the oppressors. However, a king generally reveals himself in rather more dramatic circumstances, like a war, for example. Things were going well. Surely, for all their self-centered stupidity, one of them would be bright enough to make the suggestion. <clears throat> there used to be some old prophecy or something, said Brother Plaster. My granddad told me. His eyes glade with the effort of dramatic recall. Yeah, the king will come bringing law and justice and know nothing but the truth and protect and serve the people with his sword. You don't all have to look at me like that. I didn't make it up. <clears throat> oh, we all know that one. And a fat lot of good that'd be, said Brother Watchtower. I mean, what does he do? Ride in with law and truth and so on, like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Hello, everyone, he squeaked. I'm the king, and that's truth over there, watering his horse. Not very practical, is it? Nah, you can't trust all legends. <clears throat> Why not? said Brother Dunnikin in a peeved voice. Cause they're legendary. That's how you can tell, said Brother Watchtower. Sleeping princesses is a good one, said Brother Plaster. Only a king can wake them up. <clears throat> Don't be daft, said Brother Watchtower severely. We haven't got a king, so we can't have princesses. Stands to reason. Of course, in the old days, it was easy, said Brother Doorkeeper happily. Why? He just had to kill a dragon. The Supreme Grand Master clapped his hands together and offered a silent prayer to any god who happened to be listening. He'd been right about these people. Sooner or later, their rambling little minds took them where you wanted them to go. What an interesting idea, he trilled. Wouldn't it work, said Brother Watchtower dourly. There ain't no big dragons now. There could be. The Supreme Grand Master cracked his knuckles. Come again, said Brother Watchtower. I said there could be. There was a nervous laugh from the depths of Brother Watchtower's cow. <laughs> <clears throat> well, a real thing? Great big scales and wings? Yes. Breath like a blast furnace? Yes. Them big claw things on its feet? Talons? Oh, yes. As many as you want. What do you mean, as many as I want? I would hope it's self-explanatory, Brother Watchtower. If you want dragons, you can have dragons. You can bring a dragon here, now, into the city. Me? All of you. I mean, us, said the Supreme Grand Master. Brother Watchtower hesitated. Well, I don't know if that's very good. And it would obey your every command. That stopped them. That pulled them up. That dropped in front of their weaselly little minds like a lump of meat in a dog pound. Can 
You just repeat that, said Brother Plaster slowly. You can control it. You can make it do whatever you want. What, a real dragon? The Supreme Grand Master's eyes rolled in the privacy of his hood. Yes, a real one. Not a little pet swamp dragon. The genuine article. But all thought they were, you know, myths. The Supreme Grand, <clears throat> the Supreme Grand Master leaned forward. They were myths. And they were real, he said loudly. Both a wave and a particle. You've lost me there, said Brother Plasterer. I will demonstrate then. The book, please, Brother Fingers. Thank you, brethren. I must tell you that when I was undergoing my tuition by the secret masters. The what, Supreme Grand Master? said Brother Plaster. Why don't you listen? You never listen. <clears throat> he said the secret masters, said Brother Watchtower. You know, the venerable sages that live on some mountain and secretly run everything and taught him all this lore and that and can walk on fires and that. He told us last week, he's going to teach us, aren't you Supreme Grand Master? He finished obsequiously. Oh, the secret masters, said Brother Plaster. Sorry, he says, Mr. Coods, sorry, secret. I remember. <clears throat> but when I rule the city, the Supreme Grand Master said to himself, there is going to be none of this. I shall form a new secret society of keen-minded and intelligent men, although not too intelligent, of course, not too intelligent. And we will overthrow the cold tyrant, and we will usher in a new age of enlightenment and fraternity and humanism, and Ankh Morpork will become a utopia and people like Brother Plaster will be roasted over slow fires if I have any say in the matter, which I will, and his figgin. Footnote. A figgin is defined in the dictionary of eye-watering words as a small short crust pasty containing raisins. The dictionary would have been invaluable for the Supreme Grand Master when he thought up the society's oaths, since it also includes welchit, a type of weight waistcoat worn by certain clockmakers, gaskin, a shy gray-brown bird of the coot family, and moles, a game of skill and dexterity involving tortoises. <clears throat> When I was, as I said, undergoing my tuition by the secret masters, he continued. That was where they told you you had to walk on rice paper, wasn't it? Said Brother Watchtower conversationally. I always thought that was a good bit. I've been saving it off the bottom of my macaroons ever since. Amazing, really. I can walk on it, no trouble. Shows what being in a proper secret society does for you, does that. When he is on the griddle, the Supreme Grand Master thought, Brother Plaster will not be lonely. <clears throat> Your footfalls on the road of enlightenment are an example to us all, Brother Watchtower, he said. If I may continue, however, among the many secrets, from the heart of being, said Brother Watchtower approvingly. From the heart, as Brother Watchtower says, of being was the current location of the noble dragons. The belief that they died out is quite wrong. They simply found a new evolutionary niche and they can be summoned from it. This book, he flourished it, gives us specific instructions. It's just in a book, said Brother Plasterer. 
No ordinary book. This is the only copy. It has taken me years to track it down, said the Supreme Grand Master. It's in the handwriting of Tubal de Malachite, a great student of dragon law, his actual handwriting. He summoned dragons of all sizes, and so can you. There was another long, awkward silence. Um, said Brother Doorkeeper. Sounds a bit like, you know, magic to me, said Brother Watchtower, in the nervous tone of the man who has spotted which cup the pea is hidden under, but doesn't like to say, I mean, not wishing to question your supreme wisdomship and that, but, well, you know, magic. His voice trailed off. Yeah, said Brother Plasterer uncomfortably. It's uh, the wizard, see, said Brother Fingers. You probably didn't know this when you was banged up with them venerable Herberts on the mountain. But the wizards around here come down on you like a ton of bricks if they catches you doing anything like that. <clears throat> Demarcation, they call it, said Brother Plaster. Like, I don't go around fiddling with the mystic interleaved was names of casualty, and they don't do any plastering. <clears throat> I fail to see the problem, said the Supreme Grand Master. In fact, he saw it all too clearly. This was the last hurdle. Help their tiny little minds over this, and he held the world in the palm of his hand. Their stupefyingly unintelligent self-interest hadn't let him down so far. Surely it couldn't fail him now. The brethren shuffled uneasily. Then Brother Dunnikin spoke. Huh, wizards. What do they know about today's work? The Supreme Grand Master breathed deeply. Ah. The air of mean-minded resentfulness thickened noticeably. <clears throat> Nothing, and that's a fact, said Brother Fingers. Going around with their noses in the air, too good for the likes of us. I used to see him when I walked up the university. Backside's a mile wide, I'm telling you. Catch him doing a job of honest toil. <clears throat> Look, thieving, you mean? Said Brother Watchtower, who had never liked Brother Fingers much. <clears throat> of course, they tell you, Brother Fingers went on, pointedly ignoring the comment. That you shouldn't go around doing magic on account of only them knowing about not disturbing the universal harmony and whatnot. Load of rubbish, in my opinion. Well, said Brother Plaster, oh, I don't know. Really, I mean, you get the mix wrong. You just got a lot of damp plaster around your ankles, but you get a bit of magic wrong. And they say ghastly things come out in the woodwork and stitches you right up. Yeah, but it's the wizards that say that said Brother Watchtower, thoughtfully. Never could stand them myself to tell the truth. Could be they're on to a good thing and don't want the rest of us to find out. It's only waving your arms and chanting when all's said and done. The brethren considered this. It sounded plausible. If they were on to a good thing, they certainly wouldn't want anyone else muscling in. The Supreme Grand Master decided that the time was ripe. Then we are agreed, brethren. You are prepared to practice magic. Oh, practice, said Brother Plaster, relieved. I don't mind practicing so long as we don't have to do it for real. The Supreme Grand Master thumped the book. I mean, carry out real spells. Put the city back on the right lines, 
summon a dragon, he shouted. They took a step back. Then Brother Doorkeeper said, and then if we get this dragon, the rightful king will turn up just like that. Yes, said the Supreme Grand Master. I can see that, said Brother Watchtower supportively. Stands to reason because of destiny and the gnomic workings of fate. There was a moment's hesitation and then a general nodding of cows. Only Brother Plaster looked vaguely unhappy. Well, he said, it won't get out of hand, will it? I assure you, Brother Plaster, that you can give it up any time you like, said the Supreme Grand Master smoothly. Well, all right, said the reluctant brother. Just for a bit, then. Could we get it to stay here long enough to burn down, for example, any oppressive vegetable shops? Ah. He'd won. There'd be dragons again. And a king again. Not like the old kings. A king who would do what he was told. That, said the Supreme Grand Master, depends on how much help you can be. We shall need, initially, any items of magic you can bring. It might not be a good idea to let them see that the last half of the Malachite's book was a charred lump. The man was clearly not up to it. He could do a lot better, and absolutely no one would be able to stop him. Thunder rolled. It is said that the gods play games with the lives of men. But what games, and why, and the identities of the actual pawns, and what the game is, and what the rules are, who knows? Best to not speculate. Thunder rolled. It rolled a six. Now, pull back briefly from the dripping streets of Ankh Morpork, pan across the morning mists of the disk and focus in again on a young man heading for the city with all the openness, sincerity, and innocence of purpose of an iceberg drifting into a major shipping lane. The young man is called Carrot. This is not because of his hair, which his father has always clipped short for reasons of hygiene. It was because of his shape. It is the kind of tapering shape a boy gets through clean living, healthy eating, and good mountain air in huge lungfuls. When he flexes his shoulder muscles, other muscles have to move out of the way first. He is also bearing a sword presented to him in mysterious circumstances. Very mysterious circumstances. Surprisingly, therefore, there is something very unexpected about this sword. It isn't magical. It hasn't got a name. When you wield it, you don't get a feeling of power. You just get blisters. You could believe it was a sword that had been used so much that it had ceased to be anything other than a quintessential sword, a long piece of metal with very sharp edges and it hasn't got destiny written all over it. It's practically unique, in fact. Thunder rolled. The gutters of the city gurgled softly as the detri detri det detritus of the night was carried along, in some cases protesting feebly. When it came to the recumbent figure of Captain Vines, the water diverted, and flowed around him in two streams. Vimes opened his eyes. There was a moment of empty peace before memory hit him like a shovel. It had been a bad day for the watch. There had been the funeral of Herbert Gaskin, for one thing. Poor old Gaskin. He had broken one of the fundamental rules of being a guard. It wasn't the sort of rule that someone like Gaskin could break twice. And so he'd been lowered into sodden ground with the rain drumming on his coffin and no one present to mourn him but the three surviving members of the night watch, 
the most despised group of men in the entire city. Sergeant Colin had been in tears. Poor old Gaskin. Poor old Vimes, Vimes thought. Poor old Vimes, here in gutter. But that's where he started. Poor old Vimes, with the water swirling in under breastplate. Poor old Vimes, watching rest of gutter's contents ooze by. Probably even poor old Gaskin has got better view now, he thought. Let's see. He'd gone off after the funeral and got drunk. No, not drunk. Another word ended with er. Drunker, that was it. Because world all twisted up and wrong, like distorted glass, only came back into focus if he looked at it through bottom of bottle. Something else now. What was it? Oh, yes, night time. Time for duty. Not for Gaskin, though. Have to get new fellow. New fellow coming anyway. Wasn't that it? Some stick from the Hicks? Written letter. Some tick from the Schicks. Vimes gave up and slumped back. The gutter continued to swirl. Overhead, the lighted letters fizzed and flickered in the rain. It wasn't only the fresh mountain air that had given Carrot his huge physique. Being brought up in a gold mine run by dwarfs and working a 12-hour day hauling wagons to the surface must have helped. He walked with a stoop. What will do that is being brought up in a gold mine run by dwarfs who thought that five feet was a good height for a ceiling. He'd always known he was different, more bruised for one thing. And then one day his father had come up to him, or rather come up to his waist, and told him that he was not, in fact, as he had always believed, a dwarf. It's a terrible thing to be nearly 16 and the wrong species. We didn't like to say so before, son, said his father. We thought you'd grow out of it, see? Grow out of what? said Carrot. Growing, but now your mother thinks, that is, we both think. <clears throat> it's time you went out among your own kind. I mean, it's not fair, keeping you cooped up here without company of your own height. His father twiddled a loose rivet on his helmet, a sure sign that he was worried. Er, he added. But you're my kind, said Carrot desperately. In a manner of speaking, yes, said his father. In another manner of speaking, which is a rather more precise and accurate manner of speaking, no. It's all this genetics business, you see. So it might be a very good idea if you were to go out and see something of the world. What, for good? Oh, no. No, of course not. Come back and visit whenever you like. But, well, a lad your age, stuck down here, it's not right, you know. I mean, not a child anymore, having to shuffle around on your knees most of the time and everything. It's not right. What is my own point, then? said Carrot, bewildered. The old dwarf took a deep breath. You're human, he said. Oh, like Mr. Van Eschy. Mr. Van Eschy drove an ox cart up at the mountain trails once a week to trade things for gold. One of the big people? <clears throat> You're six foot six, lad. He's only five foot. The dwarf twiddled the loose rivet again. You see how it is. Yes, but... But maybe I'm just tall for my height, said Carrot desperately. After all, if you can have short humans, can't you have tall dwarfs? His father patted him companionably on the back of the knees. You've got to face fact, boy. You'll be much more at home up on the surface. It's in your blood. 
The roof isn't so low either. <clears throat> you can't keep knocking yourself out on the sky, he told himself. Hold on, said Carrot, his honest brow wrinkling with the effort of calculation. You're a dwarf, right? And Mam's a dwarf? So how oh, I should be a dwarf too? Fact of life. The dwarf sighed. <sighs> He'd hoped to creep up on this over a period of months, maybe. Sort of break it to him gently. But there wasn't any time anymore. Sit down, Lord, he said. Carrot sat. The thing is, he said wretchedly, when the boy's big honest face was a little near his own. We found you in the woods one day, toddling about near one of the tracks. Um, the loose rivet squeaked. The king plunged on. Thing is, you see, there were these courts on fire, as you might say, and dead people. Um, yes, extremely dead people because of bandits. It was a bad winter that winter. There were all sorts coming into the hills. So we took you in, of course, and then. Well, it was a long winter, like I said, and your mum got used to you, and well, we never got around to asking Arneshi to make inquiries. That's the long and the short of it. Carrot took this fairly calmly, mostly because he didn't understand nearly all of it. Besides, as far as he was aware, being found toddling in the woods was the normal method of childbirth. A dwarf is not considered old enough to have the technical processes explained to him until he has reached puberty. Footnotes. The pronoun is used by dwarfs to indicate both sexes. All dwarfs have beards and wear up to 12 layers of clothing. Gender is more or less optional. Uh, puberty, i.e. about 55. All right, Dad, he said, and leaned down so as to be level with the dwarf's ear. But you know me, and you know Minty Rocksmacker. She's really beautiful, Dad. Got a beard as soft as a... Uh, a very soft thing. We've got an understanding, and... Yes said the dwarf coldly. Oh, I know. Her father's had a word with me. So did her mother with your mother, he added silently. And then she had a word with me. Lots of words. It's not that they don't like you. You're a steady lad and a fine worker. You'd make a good son-in-law. Four good sons-in-law. That's the trouble. And she's only 60, anyway. It's not proper. It's not right. He'd heard about children being reared by wolves. He wondered whether the leader of the pack ever had to sort out something tricky like this. Perhaps he'd have to take him into a quiet clearing somewhere and say, Look, son, you might have wondered why you're not as hairy as everyone else. He'd discussed it with Varneshi. A good, solid man, Varneshi. Of course, he'd known the man's father and his grandfather. Now he came to think about it. Humans didn't seem to last long. It was probably all the effort of pumping blood up that high. <clears throat> Got a problem there, King. Right enough, the old man had said. <clears throat> uh, King, footnote, literally... Does kind of knick, mine supervisor. <clears throat> Got a problem there, King. Right enough, the old man had said, as they shared a nip of spirits on a bench outside shaft number two. He's a good lad, mind you, said the king. Sound character, honest, not exactly brilliant, but you tell him to do something, and he don't rest until he's done it. Obedient. Yeah, I could chop his legs off, said Verneshi. It's not his legs that's going to be the problem, said the king darkly. Oh, yes. Well, in that case, you could. No, 
No, agreed, Varneshi, thoughtfully. Hmm. Well, then what you should do is you should send them away for a bit. Let him mix a bit with humans. He sat back. What you've got here, King, is a duck, he added in knowledgeable tones. Oh, I don't think I should tell him that. He is refusing to believe he's a human as it is. What I mean is a duck brought up among chickens, well-known farmyard phenomenon, finds it can't bloody well peck and doesn't know what swimming is. The king listened politely. Dwarfs don't go in much for agriculture. But you send them off to see a lot of other ducks. Let him get his feet wet, and he won't go running around after bantams anymore. And Bob's your uncle. Varneshi <laughs> sat back and looked rather pleased with himself. When you spend a large part of your life underground, you develop a very literal mind. Dwarfs have no use for metaphor and simile. Rocks are hard. The darkness is dark. Start messing around with descriptions like that, and you're in big trouble, is their motto. But after 200 years of talking to humans, the king had, as it were, developed a painstaking mental toolkit, which was nearly adequate for the job of understanding them. Surely, Bjorn strong in the arm is my uncle, he pointed out slowly. Same thing. There was a pause while the king subjected this to careful analysis. You're saying, he said, weighing each word, that we should send Carrot away to be a duck among the humans because Bjorn strong in the arm is my uncle. He's a fine lad, plenty of openings for a big strong lad like him, said Varneshi. Oh, I've heard that dwarfs go off to work in the big city, said the king uncertainly, and they send back money to their families, which is very commendable and proper. <clears throat> there you are then, give him a job in, in. Varneshi sought for inspiration. In the watch or something. My great grandfather was in the watch, you know. Fine job for a big lad, my granddad said. What is a watch? said the king. Oh, said Varneshi, with the vagueness of someone whose family for the last three generations hadn't traveled more than 20 miles. They goes about making sure people keep the laws and do what they're told. That is a very proper concern, said the king, who, since he was usually the one doing the telling, had very solid views about people doing what they were told. Of course, they don't take just anyone, said Varneshi, dredging the depths of his recollection. Oh, I should think not, or such an important task. I shall write to their king. I don't think they have a king there said Varneshi. Just some man who tells him what to do. The king of the dwarfs took this calmly. This seemed to be about 97% of the definition of kingship, as far as he was concerned. Carrot took the news without fuss, just as he took instructions about reopening shaft number four or cutting timber for shoring props. All dwarfs are by nature dutiful, serious, literate, obedient, and thoughtful people whose only minor failing is a tendency, after one drink, to rush at enemies, screaming, Arr! and axing their legs off at the knee. Carrot saw no reason to be any different. He would go to this city, whatever that was, and have a man made of him. They took only the finest, Varneshis had said. A watchman had to be a skilled fighter and clean in thought, word, and deed. From the depths of his ancestral anecdotage, the old man had dragged tales of moonlight chases across rooftops and tremendous battles with miscreants, which, of course, his great-granddad had won, despite being heavily outnumbered. 
Carrot had to admit it sounded better than my name. After some thought, the king wrote to the ruler of Ankh Morpork, respectfully asking if Carrot could be considered for a place among the city's finest. Letters rarely got written in that mine. Work stopped and the whole clan had sat around in respectful silence as his pen scrittered across the parchment. His aunt had been sent up to Varneshi's to beg his pardon, but he could see his way clear to sparing a smidgen of wax. His sister had been sent down to the village to ask Mistress Garlic, the witch, how you stopped spelling recommendation. Months had gone by. And then there'd been the reply. It was fairly grubby, since the mail in the ram tops was generally handed to whoever was going in more or less the right direction, and it was also fairly short. It said, bat baldly, that his application was accepted, and would he present himself for duty immediately. <clears throat> Just like that, he said, who oh, thought there'd be tests and things, to see if all was suitable. You're my son, said the king. I told them that. See, stones to reason you'll be suitable. Probably officer material. He pulled a sack from under his chair, rummaged around in it, and presented Carrot with a length of metal, more a sword than a saw, but only just. This might rightly belong to you, he said. When we found the carts... This was the only thing left. The bandits, you see, just between you and me. He beckoned Carrot closer. We had a witch look at it, in case it was magic. But it isn't quite the most unmagical sword she'd ever seen, she said. They normally have a bit, see, on account of its, like, magnetism, I suppose. Got quite a nice balance, though. He handed it over. He rummaged around some more. And then there's this. He held up a shirt. It'll protect ya. <clears throat> Carrot fingered it carefully. It was made from the wool of ramtop sheep, which had all the warmth and softness of hog bristles. It was one of the legendary woolly dwarf vests, the kind of vest that needs hinges. Protect me from what? He said. Cold and so on, said the king. Your mother says you've got to wear it. And uh, that reminds me. Mr. Varnesh says he'd like you to drop in on the way down the mountain. He's got something for you. His father and mother had waved him out of sight. <clears throat> Minty didn't. Funny that, she seemed to have been avoiding him lately. He'd taken the sword, slung on his back, sandwiches and clean underwear in his pack, and the world more or less at his feet. In his pocket was the famous letter from the patrician, the man who ruled the great fine city of Ankh Morpork. At least that's how his mother had referred to it. It certainly had an important looking crest at the top, but the signature was something like Lupin Squiggle Seki PP. Still, if it wasn't actually signed by the patrician, then it had certainly been written by someone who worked for him. Or in the same building. Probably the patrician had at least known about the letter in general terms. Not this letter, perhaps, but probably he knew about the existence of letters in general. Carrot walked steadfastly down the mountain paths, disturbing clouds of bumblebees. After a while, he unsheathed the sword and made experimental stabs at felonious tree stumps and unlawful assemblies of stinging nettles. Varnashi was sitting outside his hut, threading dried mushrooms on a string. <clears throat> Hello, Carrot, he said, leading the way inside. Looking forward to the city. Carrot gave this due consideration. No, he said. Having second thoughts, are ya? No, I was just walking along, said Carrot honestly. 
I wasn't thinking about anything much. <clears throat> Your dad gave you the sword, did he? Said Varneshi, rummaging on a fetid shelf. Yes, and a woolly vest to protect me against chills. <clears throat> oh, yes, it can be very damp down there, so I've heard. Protection, very important. He turned around and added dramatically, This belonged to my great grandfather. It was a strange, vaguely hemispherical device surrounded by straps. It's some sort of sling, said Carrot after examining it in polite silence. Varneshi told him what it was. <clears throat> Called peace, luck, and fish, said Carrot, mystified. No, it's for the fortune, mumbled Varneshi. You should wear it all the time. Protects your vitals. Like, Carrot tried it on. It's a bit small, Mr. Varneshi. That's because you don't wear it on your head, you see? Varneshi explained some more. To Carrot's mountaining, <clears throat> to Carrot's mounting bewilderment and subsequently horror. <laughs> My great granddad used to say, Varneshi finished, that but for this, I wouldn't be here today. What did I mean by that? Varneshi's mouth opened and shut a few times. I've no idea, he said spinelessly. Anyway, the shameful thing was now at the very bottom of Carrot's pack. Dwarfs didn't have much truck with things like that. The ghastly preventative represented a glimpse into a world as alien as the backside of the moon. There had been another gift from Mr. Varneshi. It was a small but very thick book bound in a leather that had become like wood over the years. It was called The Laws and Ordinances of the Cities of Ankh and Morpork. This belonged to my great granddad as well, he said. This is what the watch has to know. You have to know all the laws, he said virtuously, to be a good officer. Perhaps Varneshi should have recalled that in the whole of Carrot's life, no one had ever really lied to him or given him an instruction that he wasn't meant to take quite literally. Carrot solemnly took the book. It would never have occurred to him, if he was going to be an officer of the watch, to be less than a good one. It was a 500-mile journey, and surprisingly quite uneventful. People who are rather more than six feet tall and nearly as broad across the shoulders often have uneventful journeys. People jump out at them from behind rocks, then say things like, Oh, sorry, I thought you were someone else. He'd spent most of the journey reading, and now Ankh Morpork was before him. It was a little disappointing. He expected high white towers rearing over the landscape, and flags Ankh Morpork didn't rear. Rather, it sort of skulked, clinging to the soil as if afraid someone might steal it. There were no flags. There was a guard on the gate. At least he was wearing chainmail, and the thing he was propped up against was a spear. He had to be a guard. Carrot saluted him and presented the letter. The man looked at it for some time. Mm, he said eventually. <clears throat> oh, I think I've got to see Loop and Squiggle Secchi P.P., said Carrot. <clears throat> What's the P.P. for, said the guard suspiciously. Could it be pretty promptly, said Carrot, who had wondered about this himself. Well, I don't know about any secchi, said the guard. You want Captain Vimes of the Night Watch? <clears throat> and where is he based, said Carrot politely. At this time of day, I'll try the bunch of grapes in Easy Street, said the guard. He looked Carrot up and down. Join in the watch, are you? Oh, I hope to prove worthy, yes, said Carrot. The guard gave him what could loosely be called an old-fashioned look. 
it was practically Neolithic. What was it you done? He said. I'm sorry, said Carrot. You must have done something, said the guard. <clears throat> My father wrote a letter, said Carrot proudly. Oh, I've been volunteered. Bloody hellfire, said the guard.